When watching ancient, massive battles on TV, I often wonder how real these depictions are. How did huge armies actually maneuver? What did the clash of ranks look like? Could soldiers tell friend from foe? Could generals tell what was going on? Did heroes duel in combat? Did archers provide support fire? How effective were formations for attack and defense? I've got a ton of questions. Certainly Hollywood has its hunches. But today, I wanted to get answers from none other than the ditch man himself. The really cool thing about this scene is they have a ditch. You've got to give points for a good ditch. If that was your plan all along, why dig the ditch in the first place? <laughs> the horses aren't going to try and go into those ditches. Again, they should have been digging ditches. You should be digging ditches. Ditch and a palisade. It's that simple. It's easy. You've got to have a ditch. Ditches. Just lots and lots of ditches. Well, you know this. Where's your ditch? Hello everyone, I'm Roko Neindijk. I'm an ancient historian. I teach at Lincoln College, University of Oxford. I've written the script for some of the Invicta videos that you know and love. Um, and I'm here today to review depictions of large ancient armies in movies and TV. So I love bringing on these sorts of experts like our friend Dr. Rule Kananendike to tease apart the biases inherent in media and how they really botch history and corporatize it and make it false and sensational and really get us away from the truth. And this sort of teasing a part of the facts to get at truth when it comes to history is just as important when it comes to consuming everyday news. And that brings us to today's sponsor, Ground News. It's an app and website which helps empower you to be a properly informed consumer of the news. And unlike modern trends which seek to sensationalize and distill reality down into propaganda McNuggets of information, Ground News actually does the opposite. They have a mission of providing you with the tools to think critically, consider nuances, identify biases, and take part in open discussions. And one of my favorite tools to this end is going to be their internet browser extension. Essentially what it lets you do is anytime you run into a news article, ground news information pops up that tells you about its factuality, it tells you about media biases, the sources, the distribution of left, right, and center that are covering it, and this is very, very helpful for me. And let's say, for instance, you wanted to get more information on the elections in Russia and you found an article, you can go directly to the Ground News website and get exposed to a 360 degree view of who's covering the news and really get a more nuanced take on things. And what's really important on top of this is basically knowing what you don't know. And that's where the blind spot feature comes in really clutch because what it does is it actually feeds you information that is being covered more exclusively by the left or the right so that you're never blindsided by information and you can see kind of what's going on in other people's news sources. I honestly love Ground News and think they've crafted some of the best set of tools to survive our age of misinformation. So if you want to maintain a healthy media diet, go to ground.news invicta to try it out for $1 a month or subscribe using my link for 40% off the unlimited access vantage plan, which I found to be an indispensable part of my online life. Enjoy. What is happening? Do you know? No idea. Come on, come on! Follow me! Where are you going? When in doubt. Attack! <laughs> no! This seems very cute. Obviously, it's because of the way the series has characterized Mark Antony that he has to sort of sit there quietly eating and not being confused or perturbed at all by the fact that he's going to have to go into this fight and he has no idea what's going on. Ancient battles were chaotic in the sense that it was very difficult for anyone on the ground in the fighting to have any kind of sense of the bigger picture. They were much too focused on their own survival and the survival of the men around them. And so it was very difficult for them to give any kind of account of what was going on elsewhere. Um, because they were in the thick of the fighting, they had other things to worry about. And they were trying to lead in a different way. They were trying to give the right example, you know, taking the risks, doing the fighting, leading the charge, etc. Um, but then in later times, you know, and this goes on from the Hellenistic period onwards, from the later classical period even, you have some Greeks who prefer to lead this way. You have the so-called sort of battlefield manager. This is a person who stays back and tries to maintain oversight, 
and is who is informed of what happens by messengers going back and forth, by signals going up on the battlefield. And he's then able to respond to those signals by giving sort of signals, you know, uh, trumpets, bells, flags, whatever else of his own. When you see Mark Antony here leaning back in a tree line somewhere with his, with his cavalry guard, you kind of hope that he would have some greater understanding about what was going on, either because of where he was sitting so that he had the oversight, or because messengers were going back and forth trying to let him know what was going on. So what's being depicted in this scene is kind of a mix of two things. On the one hand, you have the soldier's general command style where you know, people come, go into battle themselves, lead by example. They might not know what's going on. Alternatively, you have the, you know, the, 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 the battle manager command style, which is he seems to be taking on, um, who really ought to have some idea of what's going on and whose entire purpose in holding back is to try and maintain that level of control. So they've done some interesting stuff in this scene where they try to depict these two huge Roman armies that are obviously tactically fairly identical um, to show them approaching each other across this massive field. And it's very interesting to see how, you know, as they approach that, that battle line, that no man's land in front of each other, um, they're actually in pretty clear formations, which are meant to represent these sort of Roman maniples or cohorts. And by this time, they really should be cohort formation. So they should be a bit larger, but ooh, that's that's fine. Um, the idea is that they are in these sort of rectangular blocks of men that are orderly rank and file. Um, and this is obviously the way in which a Roman legion could be very effective. They are a very disciplined formation which goes into combat as a unit. Uh, it's very hard to break them apart and they protect each other. The fact that they are in ranks and files means that they are able to support each other in combat and able to form a united front. And so you see this on both sides happening and they, they sort of start to approach each other. That all looks good until they very suddenly cross the no man's land between them and go directly into this massive confused melee. People ask me this a lot, you know, how did they know, you know, who was on which side, especially in these kind of battles between armies that are more or less equally equipped, um, who are functionally indistinguishable from each other. Well, you know, because people on your side are facing one way, the people on the other side are facing the other way. <laughs> And you want to make sure that there's a clear distinction between the two, um, either by maintaining a distance, maintaining that no man's land, or by maintaining your battle line. And if that isn't the case, if there is a gap, if there are enemies behind that line, if you're not sure who's who or who's facing which way, what would almost inevitably happen in ancient combat is that you would run away. Your entire side would break from combat, either run or retreat to a place that was safe and then restore their line and see what kind of order could be established. I mean, this is a situation you don't want to be in. You don't want to be in, in, a, in a sort of confused melee where you don't know who's who. And so you would try to get out of that situation as fast as possible and restore some semblance of the order that you want in order to fight effectively. This is another example of a movie that kind of just ruins it for itself. Like they start out really well in the sense of trying to show how an army marches from column and then deploys into line, how these sort of Roman formations form this checkerboard of smaller units and how they form a mutually supporting line. But then as soon as you get there, it just devolves into absolute chaos. And it's, it's, it's just frustrating to watch. You're just like, you could have done it. You almost did it. You almost had a real battle that might have looked like the clash of Roman legions. But instead, you decided to go with just another Hollywood brawl, which has just no connection to any modern reconstructions of what an ancient battle looked like. So, you know, you, you, points for effort in trying to start it off the right way, but then you threw it all out the window. I couldn't give this more than a 4 out of 10. Shield wall! Lights out! This is a really interesting little scene where, I mean, the whole point of this uh, battle scene is that Hercules supposedly has been training this army, has been updating their equipment, and now it is a much more effective force because of his leadership and his good tactical ideas. And the way that they try to portray that is that as it moves into combat, it is able to respond to certain commands. 
is able to act much more cohesively and is able to form a very strong shield wall against the enemy. But the depiction of it is a little bit strange in the sense that their marching column is enormously wide. Um, first of all, it's sort of it's almost like a big square that's like 100 wide and 100 deep or something, um, which is not how a marching column obviously works because how many roads in the ancient world were there where people could march um, 100 abreast? It's just not likely. You're much more likely to be marching two or four abreast or something like that along a road and then when you come into battle, you have to perform quite an elaborate maneuver to turn that column into a line. And certainly the way that works is not the way it's depicted here. By getting your troops that are marching a column to slot in one next to each other as files, um, one next to each other, you know, every file that comes up down the road or every two or three or four files that come up down the road will march to the right or to the left usually of the one that's already in place. And so brick by brick, you build up your infantry line. And so you don't just take the sides of that formation and turn them out like wings and make them form part of your battle line. You would have to take those files and slot them in one at a time as a sort of um, a sort of wall building mechanism, um, which, you know, the ancient armies had, had well-developed systems to do this, which allowed you to build the battle line that you have deemed most effective and on the basis of which you have organized your army. So given that this is a fantasy story, I mean, obviously you don't want to be too harsh. It's, it doesn't, it's not real. Um, they're just trying to depict something that looks like, you know, to the viewer, like an ancient battle formation going into battle. So, okay, you know, that's, that's really nice. Some of the pieces of kit that they're wearing are, are very authentic. Others are made up, you know. But the whole principle that they explain in the movie is that as you work together as a formation using shields that you, you know, deploy in an interlinked, mutually supportive way, that you become stronger than men fighting individually. I mean, they've really sort of tried to capture that and put that on display here with this marching column. And so to that extent, I think it's, it's really, you know, it's admirable for what it's trying to do. It just doesn't have any connection to any specific, you know, historical event. Um, and certainly that column is much too wide and I've tried to explain how, you know, how this doesn't actually, you know, how a, how a formation deploying from column into line doesn't actually function that way. So they've kind of gotten it wrong, but it's, you know, with good intentions, shall we say. Um, so I would give that five or six out of ten. So I think Troy is actually trying to do something really interesting here, where on the one side you have the Trojan army, which is clearly well organized in forming this impenetrable shield wall. And on the other side, you have the Greek army, which is obviously led by this impetuous, angry general Agamemnon, uh, which therefore behaves um, much more like an armed mob. And in some ways, this obviously works for the story, but it's not very realistic for all the reasons that you can see in this scene. The men who are crashing into the shield wall are literally sort of plunging to their death. Some of them are sort of tumbling over the shield wall, completely losing cohesion, completely losing order, and very quickly losing their lives. Um, realistically, they would start to slow down and try to find a way to weaken that line before they actually made contact with it. Um, either they would try to, you know, get up close to it and start poking at it with spears, because, I mean, you have those spears, that's what you're going to do. Um, try and make some gaps into it that way, or you would stop at a greater distance and first use missiles. And in fact, you know, some famous armies like, for instance, the Celts and the Romans would carry javelins into close combat specifically for that reason. They would halt, um, they would start throwing those javelins first, hoping to break the enemy formation before they ever thought about charging in, because this is how you can try to weaken that formation, weaken that shield wall, and then you might actually have a chance of assaulting it with some success. So you can see these waves of arrows coming in, which obviously looks really spectacular. Um, and you even have this scene where, you know, Agamemnon's in his chariot and his charioteer is killed and he has to sort of take the reins himself, which is a very Homeric scene. It happens a few times in the poem. And of course it builds on the idea that if you're under a city wall, 
your troops are covered by the men on the wall. And this is something that a lot of Greeks historically preferred to do. They would fight near a city wall so that if something went wrong, they had to retreat to their city or fortified position. You would then um, be under cover of the men on the wall. So they would be able to protect you with their missiles against the people who were pursuing you, against the people who are chasing you to that city. So in a way, being under the walls is very safe because of those, because of that archer support, essentially, or the slingers on the walls. Um, however, what you're seeing in this scene is a battle that's taking place on the foot of the walls and the archers are throwing, are, are firing over their own men. That's actually not a very good proposition because of course you're very likely to shoot your own men in the back. And so it's very likely the men, the men on the ground would actually be begging the guys on the walls to stop shooting um, because there's such a great risk that they would be hit. And obviously any arrow that gets fired at a long range might sort of go over those lines and, and, and hit, the, hit the Greeks that are still approaching, which is something that you see in the scene. But, you know, arrows for all sorts of reasons may inadvertently end up falling short and you don't really want to end up killing your own men in the process. So it's not something that is widely done. And in fact, deploying missile troops behind the battle line, although it's sometimes described as an option, you very rarely actually see it in historical battles because generally commanders would be very, very hesitant to try to risk um, their troops firing into the backs of their own men. So this is obviously a scene where Troy gets the most Homeric. I mean, in the poem, in the Iliad, you have all these scenes where two heroes meet each other on the battlefield and they have a big fight. And this is, you know, what gives them their glory. This is what they want. And so for the story, this obviously makes a lot of sense. But the way that battle is depicted in this movie with these huge formations of heavy infantry slamming into each other, it's basically impossible for this to happen. There is simply no room because, as I said before, these armies are halting at some distance from each other and then they start shooting missiles and, 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 and trying to peck at each other that way rather than smashing into contact. If you have a more modern, so to speak, a more developed form of heavy infantry combat in which formations are actually fighting each other, there is simply no space for this. When this later happens, when you have certain Greeks like the Spartan Aristodemus, for instance, at the Battle of Plataea, he tries to do this Homeric thing by going out alone in front of the formation and the Spartans actually say, well, you know, he was very brave, but we don't actually want to encourage this. So these kinds of duels, while they happen in the Iliad, in this, this depiction of a very early form of warfare, um, once you get to the kind of fighting that's actually depicted in the scene, it doesn't happen anymore. It can't happen and it's undesirable. I had to give it a grade. It's actually really hard to judge this one. I mean, there's so much about this movie that I really like, and I think they've done a lot of interesting things with it in terms of the way they use the source material. Um, it's not necessarily historically accurate, of course, but at least it has something of the spirit of it. And it has the great merit of creating some of the most exciting, both mass combat scenes and individual jewels that have ever been put on film, as far as I know. I mean, it's just really interesting the way they've tried to make both the equipment look unique. Uh, everybody has their own sort of specific gear that is sometimes based on real historical examples, like the Trojan helmets. Um, or the Mycenaean, in Mycenaean helmet gears, things like that. And then there are other parts where I'm just like, okay, well, this is not you know, what Homer says or anything like that. Characters keep dying at random moments. But then there are other times when it's, you know, it, it really does manage to capture something of the way that, you know, these epic poets work, like the way that these jewels are supposed to work and the way that these characters bounce off each other. Sometimes it's actually quoting the source. Um, there is a lot to this that you can feel like, you know, it gives you a rise when you know the source material, when you know this, when you recognize this, and it's like, oh, this is super cool. Um, so, you know, it depends on what kind of aspect of it you're asking me, but if I had to say, like, oh, just, just on the mass combat scenes, I mean, it's it has some really interesting features, again, like the, the shield wall formations that actually sort of really work in this case. Um, the way that they try to, you know, reflect fighting underneath at the foot of the city wall, these kind of aspects are really interesting. The equipment is broadly, you know, accurate for, I would say, you know, the, the early um, sort of Iron Age period, um, or at least inspired by elements from that period from the 8th to the 7th century in, in, in Greek and Assyrian history. So to that degree, what should we say, uh, 6 or 7 out of 10? Avançar! 
This is a, a, a bit of a strange gear shift. Um, when you're talking about the movie Troy before, and then you, you know these modern movies with their modern effects and their look, and then you go back to the 1960s and things look you know a lot more simple in a way and a lot more modest and, and, and contained. And they're obviously struggling in this movie, I think, to try and depict the Spartans as being superior in fighting um, in a way that they can actually put on screen. So for instance, 300, this later movie that is very much based on this one, um, tries to do this, for instance, through ramping, you know, through this, this speeding up and slowing down the action so that it seems like these individual feats of heroism come out more sort of cinematically. I think these early movies kind of struggle to make close combat with pre-modern weapons look cool. And so they thought, what can we give them? Well, we'll give them an infantry wedge formation. I'm honestly not sure where they got that because infantry wedge formations are not attested in Greek history. This isn't something the Spartans ever did. It's it's not something the Spartans were known to do. It's not something the Spartans were able to do. And in fact, historians doubt whether a wedge formation would even be in any sense effective. I mean, you can see in this scene that Leonidas, who is at the front of the formation, promptly dies because if you're at the front, you have many enemies in front of you and there's only you. Um, so this wedge formation, it's not something that gets used. It's certainly not something that gets used by infantry. So we're basically just seeing something that the director thought looked cool, um, but has no basis in history whatsoever. So in the final moments of the Battle of Thermopylae, Leonidas has died and the Spartans, um, we are told, retreated to a small hill to make their final stand against the Persians. They've tried to depict this here by having the Spartans pick up the body of Leonidas and bring him sort of back with the retreat in good order. This is a very difficult maneuver, but in this case it may have had to happen in some way. Um, some scholars have suggested that this must be because the Persians were temporarily sort of willing to let them go to, to leave off the pressure. Um, because that is the big question. How do you retreat from an enemy who is trying to keep the pressure on? Most ancient armies were not able to do it very well. And so this ability to maintain order even in adversity is something that gives the Spartans a huge advantage. We mustn't think of it as them stepping backwards or walking backwards while facing the enemy. Retreating in good order still means you're turning away from the enemy and you're marching with your back to them. And it's only if they try to pursue you that you would then turn around with that formation um, and face them again, which means you have to bring the, the people who are in front of your formation to the other side of the formation so that they're in front and turn all the files around. Um, it's a complex maneuver, but the Spartans could do it. Um, but at this time in history, we have no evidence that they had that level of organization yet. So again, this is something that the director clearly thought was going to look very cool and look very interesting and make the Spartans look very impressive. But we don't actually know if this has any foundation in fact. So if I had to give this a score, again, it's not easy because to some extent, I mean, the kind of weird, stilted and by modern standards, quite boring depiction of combats in this movie may well be a more accurate reflection of what actual ancient close combat might have looked like in the sense that it's all a bit clumsy and it's all a bit awkward and it's all a bit sort of seemingly now unspectacular. Um, we are used to very stylized choreographed action, whereas this seems more like a bunch of guys just kind of being told to meet each other in the middle and then when they get there they're not really quite sure what to do. Um, to some extent that seems, that seems right. Um, but then the formations they come up with are, are frankly just nonsensical. I mean, both on the Persian and on the Spartan side, these are completely unattested and, and, and strange. Um, and the way they manage to kind of actually depict the fighting, while to some extent, possibly, you know, within the limits of, of the technology accurate, um, uh, doesn't seem to, for, for me at least, doesn't seem to convey the sort of um, the drama of it very well. Um, it does, it, it, it usually kind of feels a little bit silly. Um, and it would have been better, I think, if they had actually tried to replicate the formations that we actually know about, or at least tried to theorize to some extent what massed combat would have looked like instead of coming up with random things that, that they kind of just made up. So in that sense, um, I would give that one maybe a five out of 10.
Uzi is a bit of a weird one. It's nice to see the trumpets that you'd use to try and uh, give commands on the battlefield. Obviously, this trumpet sound carries much further than vocal commands. So this is something that ancient armies would use from Greeks to Romans. Um, but on the other hand, the Romans appear to be spearmen all of a sudden, which obviously historically they are not. So they <laughs> famously fight with swords and, and javelins. Anyway, um, this is a big battle, huge armies operating in the field. Um, and then one of those armies suddenly at the command of one of its leading figures stops in place. It's likely that he, the people around him would be able to stop um, on command. Apparently, this is something that reenactors have tried to do. You know, can you charge and then stop? Apparently, people are quite responsive and people don't actually bash into each other when they do that. So it's quite possible to to not so much turn on a dime, but at least to to stop when the person in front of you suddenly stops. So that shouldn't be too much of an issue. Um, the bigger problem is that this commander is only able to speak to the people who are directly by his side and behind him. People can respond to what they see the men in front of them or the, the, the men and women in front of them doing. Um, and so in an, in an event like this, what would very likely happen is that the people around this commander who apparently know where their trench is, um, they will be able to stop on the edge of it. But the people further on the line, they're going to walk into it um, because they haven't realized that their spells have stopped just yet. Unless there are other officers along the line who also know exactly where it is and will tell those men when to stop. Spartacus. So this movie, I mean, it's very hard to judge it on historical accuracy when it's clearly not trying to be historical. I mean, nothing we're seeing here has anything much to do with anything historical except for the fact that Spartacus eventually gathered an army around him that was eventually defeated by a Roman army. I mean, that is about the extent of it and that is what you're seeing, I suppose. Um, but it does very little to actually depict anything that we could seriously call the reconstruction of ancient warfare. It's nothing to do with, with what we know of, of how a Roman army functions, certainly nothing to do with how we know about what little we know about Spartacus' army. So, um, so I would give that one, you know, two out of ten. So this movie has a really ambitious depiction of what the advance of a Roman legion into battle would look like. Um, we have these accounts from the Republican period, so from the the second and, and uh, from the mainly the second century BC, of Roman legions marching into battle in three lines. So in the front you have the young warriors, um, then behind them the more experienced ones with more expensive equipment, and at the back you have the spearmen who are sort of old veterans, um, who are there to kind of bolster the line. Um, watch over the others to make sure they're not doing anything unseemly and if really necessary to go into battle um, and decide the issue with the last reserves available. So that three line formation is what you're seeing depicted here. Um, we are told that they would advance into battle in a sort of checkerboard formation. So the first line would be split up into blocks or maniples. Um, these blocks would then be arranged sort of in a checkerboard behind each other so that each block in the second line was overlooking a gap in the first line. And then as they march into battle, we don't really know what happened next. Um, somehow these armies would fight with coherent front lines. So either the blocks in the back in the second line would march forward and fill the gaps in the first line, or the blocks in the first line would somehow expand or contract together in order to form a coherent first line, because you don't want any gaps in that. If the enemy flows into those gaps and gets into your flanks, you're in big trouble. So some kind of evolution must have happened in that advance that meant that the Romans could confront their enemies in a single coherent, cohesive line, even though they were advancing in a checkerboard formation. And this scene shows one solution, where basically uh, the theory is that these, um, these formations, as they approach into battle, essentially broaden out. They stretch out um, from the, the deeper formations in which they advance to a thinner but broader formation so that they close those gaps and form a cohesive front line, which then advances into battle as the line behind them starts to do the same. So it, this is, again, I mean, this one is a great example of a director really paying attention to the source material and trying to reconstruct it as best he could in terms of the approach of the Roman army. So he's done a really good job of depicting that. And I think we're probably not likely to see ever, you know, something as meticulous and real. You know, these are these are all like extras that are there on the field They're trying to reconstruct this ancient maneuver. And, and like that is phenomenal. That's fantastic. 
But then when it comes to the actual fighting, it's a brawl. It's once again just a big mess of dudes who are just absolutely for performing in no particular order, not operating tactically, just seeing themselves as one, you know, each man for himself. And so, again, like they've put so much effort into making this look like a Roman army as it marches into battle. And then when it is in battle, it's just a bunch of guys on a, you know, a pub brawl, basically. <laughs> it just, I, it's, it's so aggravating. Like, you're just like, you, you almost did it. You almost did it. And they can do it. Some of these movies, obviously, like Troy, um, some of these older movies as well, that, that actually show a cohesive line of shields and spears, you know, a, a, a formation that functions like a formation. They can do it. They know how to do it. Even 300 Spartans had Spartans, you know, a fictional formation, but a formation. And so... There is something there that they can they can absolutely do if they teach the extras how to do it, and it shouldn't take that long. But then, when it comes down to it, they just think you know it's more exciting to show you know a bunch of guys milling around slashing whoever appears in front of them, and, and everybody gets really confused, and in the end everyone dies because yeah, battles don't look like that. Don't do that. Stop doing that, please. Um, so I mean, points for effort at the beginning. Like if you just if you cut off there and said, okay, and this is how Spartacus lost, it would have been totally credible because you have this clear contrast of disciplined Romans and disorganized mob of of, of Spartacus's forces. I mean, just go with that. Just stop there. Eight out of ten, maybe even more. You know, fantastic depiction of of you know why Rome tends to win these battles. Um, but then they continue into a big messy brawl and, and it just goes all the way down. So like after that point, two out of 10, just complete nonsense. Why would you bother? Sorry. It's just those two things, you know? Such a great scene. They really did what they could here. Um, I mean, there's so much going on here that you can directly trace back to ancient sources, although some other parts are obviously made up because they had to work with the extras that they had. So they created various ways of trying to keep the rhythm, you know, all moving the spears back and forth and things like that. This is, you know, cute, but it doesn't really have any basis in, in fact. But then there are things like the fact that they chant um, the name of the war god Enyalios, which we are told is is the Macedonian war cry, is is a cry to Enyalios. Um, and so you hear them ch chanting Enyalios, which is supposed to be um, the name of Enyalios, turned into a way to keep the rhythm in, in the march. So these are really kind of inventive ways to make, so make sure that all these guys, these extras know what they're doing um, and, and stick to, the, uh, stick to the, the way that this is supposed to look. So as you fly over the battlefield, you can see these squares of pikes, which are the, the, the pike formation, the taxes of the Macedonian phalanx. Um, these are blocks of 16 by 16, forming 256 men. Um, there are formations of 1,500 men that consist of these blocks. Um, and there are eight of those in the, uh, in the formation, or there are six of those rather, in the, in the Macedonian formation. And you can see them all in the overview. I mean, it's all sort of laid out. Um, and then you have Alexander's cavalry, of course, the companions which are moving off to the side on one flank. Um, the intent there was hopefully to try and separate the Persian wing opposite Alexander's heavy cavalry from the rest of the army to create a gap and then to charge into that gap while further troops coming in from behind that cavalry wing on the Macedonian side would keep the Persian left wing busy. And you can see all of that unfolding exactly as our best accounts and reconstructions of this battle have it. So we are told exactly, you know, where everybody is, how they're drawn up, um, and how these forces were supposed to operate in battle. The fact that this pike phalanx, which you see very clearly here, despite being relatively vulnerable to missiles because it has quite small shields and its armor is not very heavy, um, that it has this impenetrability, this ability to take on any enemy from the front and fix them in place. And so in this scene, we actually see them attacking. We see them marching forward and advancing into these waves of arrows. 
but in the battle accounts that survive, as far as we know, it was relatively passive. It was simply standing there and taking it to make sure that the Macedonian line would remain cohesive. So there is always going to be this Macedonian base, the rock on which the rest of the around which the rest of the army can maneuver. The problem with a lot of these kinds of accounts is that a the numbers of the Persian armies are completely untrustworthy, and b the number of Persian casualties similarly are completely unverifiable and very likely exaggerated. So we don't really know how many of them actually died trying to hold up this Macedonian phalanx or trying to break it. Um, or whether the Persians would have simply decided on the various peoples that were serving them um, at that, were, that were under their yoke, um, they simply decided that it was not worth risk and, um, and buckled. The way it looks is, is frankly unrivaled. There is no other movie that does this much to try and portray the formations as they actually looked. Now, I'm well known for saying this before, but the advisors on this movie were really a crack team of scholars. There is Lloyd Llewellyn Jones at Cardiff and Robin Lane Fox at the University of Oxford, who are each um, experts in their field. So uh, Lloyd managed the, the costuming, basically. He, he designed all the, all the outfits for this movie, and uh, Robin was the one who, who was an expert on Alexander the Great, who choreographed all this, trained the, the, the Moroccan soldiers who were involved in this. Um, as the extras and, and, and rode with Alexander, you know, he was personally involved in, in making this look as good as he could. And because the director really gave them, clearly gave them a lot of leeway and, and listened to them, the result is the most accurate in terms of its faithfulness to the sources, the most accurate depiction of ancient combat that we have. Um, there's just nothing that holds a candle to this. Maybe the, uh, the beginning of that battle in, in Spartacus where you see the Roman legions approaching, that is as true to the source as this is. But there's almost nothing you could point to in these scenes that would make you go like, I don't think it actually was like that except the drums. I mean, they didn't have drums to keep rhythm. They would keep rhythm with flutes, but that would sound weird, so I guess they left that out. Um, but fundamentally, this is, this is an attempt to reconstruct it as it actually was, and in that sense it is unparalleled. Um, I would give it, you know, because you can point to these little things, I'm not going to give it a 10, but you know, 9 out of 10 it definitely deserves. And I would very much wish for directors to be trying this hard to make ancient warfare look uh, as it actually did on screen.